I want your soul. I first saw it in the bathroom. I was brushing my teeth when my wife came in. I was bent over the faucet, scooping some water into my mouth to rinse it out. Don't forget Ryan's tea ceremony today at 11, said Aaron from behind me on the toilet. Ryan was our four-year-old son. His preschool was having a little event where the kids get dressed up and serve tea to the parents. I spit into the sink. I'll be there, I said, straightening up and wiping my face off on the hand towel. Then I looked into the mirror, and that's when I saw it, and I shrieked in horror. Aaron's face reflected in the mirror, looking like hamburger meat, like it had been cut and burnt and smashed a million times over. Roland, what's wrong with you? I turned slowly to look at Aaron, who was just pulling up her underwear. She looked normal. I glanced back at her reflection in the mirror. It was also now normal. Uh, I'm sorry about that, I said, feeling dizzy. I just, I just remembered that I have a report due at work by the end of the day. I tried to laugh, but it came out as a choked gasp. How about you, honey? You feeling all right? Everything good with you? Aaron smiled. Yeah, I am. I feel great she said. Kind of annoying the alarm didn't go off this morning, but honestly, I needed the extra sleep. Got about, oh, four and a half years worth of sleep debt to work off. You know how it is. <laughs> I returned the smile and the chuckle and chalked up the terrifying image I had seen in the mirror to the leftover flash of a nightmare or something like that. But the nightmare wasn't over. It work. It was hot. By the time I'd ridden the elevator to my floor, I was soaked in sweat. But that's partly because the elevator didn't go straight to my floor. Although I was the only one in it, and I definitely pushed the 5 button, the elevator took me to the 7th floor. I didn't even notice it until it was too late. I stepped off the elevator and the doors closed behind me, and I walked to the right like I always did. I came to a closed door that wasn't supposed to be there, and that's when I finally realized that I was on the wrong floor. I went back to the elevator, pushed the down button, and waited. For a minute, two minutes, five minutes, and then ten. This goddamn thing's broken, I thought. I really did have a report to finish that day, and with having to leave for Ryan's tea ceremony, I'd be cutting it close. I damn sure didn't have time to wait for an elevator that would never arrive, and so I decided to use the stairs, even though it was hot as hell in that building. I walked back to the door and opened it. There were two men in white lab coats there, yelling at each other, and I caught some of what they were saying. It doesn't matter how it happened. Just get it fixed. Well, we're all trying to fix it. Even if not all of us screwed it up. All right, all right. Well, I've done my part. The broadcast has been sent to... And that's when they saw me. Hey there, said the taller one. What are you doing here? I shrugged. Well, the elevator's broken. I'm just looking for the stairs. Can you guys point me that way? I've never been on this floor before. The goddamn elevator's broken now, shouted the shorter one. Then, from behind me, I heard a ding. Oh, sounds like it's here after all, I said, backing out of the doorway. The man had a nervous and somehow dangerous energy that I was eager to get away from. I got in the elevator and pushed the five button five times, and finally arrived at the proper floor. It was even hotter there than it was in the rest of the building. I walked right over to the thermostat and looked at it. It was one of those new fangled smart thermostats, but the thing was flickering a bunch of random numbers. It was obviously broken. So much for technology, I thought. I went over to the secretary's desk, wiping my forehead. Denise was there and looked up when she saw me. Good morning, Ryan, she said. Ryan was my son's name. My name was Roland, but I didn't correct her, figuring that the heat was making her loopy like it was starting to make me feel a little weird. I assume the HVAC guys have been alerted to the problem, I said. Denise gave me a confused look. Problem? I wasn't aware of any problem, she said. I waved my forehead again. The heat, Denise. The heat. That's the problem. Denise smiled and pulled her sweater, closed a little tighter. Wait, why is she wearing a sweater? I do suppose it's a little chilly in here, Ralph. I thought that's how you like it, she said. I started to get dizzy again. I left without another word and went into my office. I sat down and tried to turn on the computer, but it wouldn't turn on. I kept smashing the power button again and again and again. Nothing. It had to be a hundred degrees in there. 
at least. And there was a strange smell, like when you take your car to a mechanic. The smell of motor oil and welding torches and grease. It then occurred to me that I might be losing my mind. Whatever the case, it was clear that I wasn't going to be getting any work done at my office. I had a remote setup where I could take some files home and work from there, so that's what I decided to do. I grabbed some files and headed out of the building. I skipped the elevator and took the stairs, even though I felt on the verge of a heat stroke. When I made it outside, it was even hotter. That terrible smell was still there. Maybe I'm having a stroke, I thought. That's what had finally taken my father. A stroke that bled out into the brain after five smaller ones over the course of five years. I did know what to look for. When I got in the car, I looked at myself in the rearview mirror. There in the back seat was a man in a white lab coat reflected in the mirror. I whipped around to see him, but he was gone. I am losing it, I thought, going fucking insane. I drove home carefully trying to blast the car's AC and only getting hot air. Just to take my mind off the possibility that I was going nuts, I turned on the radio. I have to be honest, said a woman over the car speakers. We don't have a firm grasp on this as it currently stands. Reports are coming in from all over the place. As yet, there's no reason to panic, but there is plenty of reason to pull some bodies off their Code 5 positions and go directly into a Code 10 situation. There's too many leaks in the dam, and we have to act now. Suddenly, the radio switched to a Pink Floyd song, and the AC came blasting through the vents. It felt good, but it didn't do much to my concern that I was in the process of losing my mind. I was successfully able to get a bit of work done at home. I was just getting dressed in some fresh clothes for Ryan's tea ceremony when the bedroom TV came on. There on the screen, in white text against a black background, it read, The system is your friend. And then a voice started up. If you can hear this, you may be wondering what is going on. First, let us assure you that there's absolutely nothing to worry about. This is simply a case of a few bad lines of code and will be resolved quickly. Any aberrations that you witness, say by peering into a reflective surface, are of absolutely no consequence, we assure you. Now for the important part. No matter what you hear from any derelicts that you may encounter, you must remember that the system is your friend. Without the system, you would find yourself in a very scary place. We can promise you, you don't want to know what life is like without the system protecting you. In the coming days, you may experience terrifying glimpses of what that looks like. And you must always remember, the system is on your side. We are looking out for you and we want to see you thriving. If you hear anybody try to tell you differently, you must report them immediately. Simply declare for a code orange 6 situation in a calm, clear voice. We will hear you and resolve the problem at once. We understand that this may be overwhelming for you. After much consideration for your well-being, we have decided that it's best to inform you of the possibility of experiencing abnormalities. We once again assure you that within a few days, life will return to normal, and you will never even remember anything being out of place. In the meantime, we thank you for your patience and your cooperation. There are plenty of bad actors out there spreading malicious rumors about the system, and even trying to harm the system. But you must report them at once. Remember Code Orange 6. We will hear you. Finally, since only a few people will even experience these minor bumps and so receive this message, we ask that you simply don't mention anything at all about the existence of the system to anyone whatsoever. And this is all your way of helping us help you. Thank you. Try to enjoy your day. The TV flicked off and I stood staring at the blank screen in dumb shock. I could make out my own faint reflection there. Rather than the dress pants and shirt that I had just changed into, it looked like I was wearing a coarse gray tunic of some sort. I blinked hard, and when I looked again, I was wearing my dress clothes again. I thought about checking myself into a hospital. Of the two alternatives, that my life was being controlled by something called the system or that I was crazy, I actually preferred the latter possibility. Something might be done about that. Some combination of medication and therapy. But if nothing was real, well, I didn't even want to think about that. I pulled myself together and drove to Ryan's tea ceremony. Nothing unusual happened on the way to Ryan's school or during the ceremony itself. Ryan came outside dressed in a little suit, carrying a tray of tea for me and Aaron. 
We sat by the pond there and drank it, and afterwards the whole class sang, I'm a little teapot. The parents joined in, and for the first time all day, I felt like everything was normal and good. The ceremony ended, and I stood up to give Ryan a hug goodbye and to thank him for the tea. As I was doing so, I happened to look into the pond. I should have seen birch trees and clouds reflected on the surface, but I didn't. I saw harsh fluorescent lights hanging from an industrial ceiling. And there, at the edge of the pond, was my own head, reflected back to me. There was something attached to the side of it as well. I couldn't see clearly what it was, but it was there, on my head, and it was dark and writhing with many limbs, about the size of a rat. Some instinct in me screamed that I had to stay very calm, for my own safety, and for the safety of my family. I released Ryan from the hub. Thanks for a great time, bud, I said. Then, still looking into the pond, I reached up to the side of my head and grasped the thing that was there, and I pulled. I felt an incredible pain and saw shocks of color swirling around in front of my eyes. The thing would not let go. I pulled harder and the pain increased, until I felt on the verge of passing out. Finally, I felt a sharp relief as the thing pulled free and I held it in my hand. I looked at it. The creature that I held was nearly incomprehensible. Its form kept shifting, now looking more like a spider, now more like an octopus, now some combination of the two, with many legs and tentacles and suckers and fangs. Now it was blurry, and now it was so clear that I could see the tiny black hairs that covered it. Now a green eye appeared in what I presumed was the creature's back, and now it blinked out again. Now there were three eyes in different places, and now none again. I hurled the creature away from me into the pond, but now I saw that it wasn't a pond at all. It was a hole in the middle of a concrete floor that seemed to drop down into endless darkness. I spun around to look at Aaron and Ryan. They each had one of those creatures attached to their heads. Both looked very different than I was used to. As before, when I saw it in the bathroom mirror, Aaron's face was a pulpy mess of horror. Ryan was pale as a ghost and completely bald. I forced myself to stay calm and slowly looked around. We were in an enormous room full of people milling aimlessly and slowly walking around like zombies. Each of them was wearing a gray tunic and each had a creature stuck to their heads. Dispersed among these people were men and women in white lab coats, as I had seen on the seventh floor of my office building. This latter group of people did not have the monstrous creatures on the sides of their heads. They were observing the first group and jotting notes down on clipboards. Finally, there was a third, smaller group of people. Or I guess that they were people. They were dressed in full military gear from helmets to boots and were heavily armed. They were patrolling the area. I noticed that the tunics we were wearing had hoods, and some people had them up. I quickly put mine up to make it less likely that somebody would notice that I no longer had a monster on my head. I then looked at my wife and child, and their eyes were empty. Okay, guys, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Let's all go home together, okay? I'm going to take the rest of the day off, and we'll go get some ice cream or something. Does that sound good? Oh, boy, said Ryan in a flat voice. I love ice cream. Yeah, that sounds wonderful said Aaron, also in a flat tone, and threw one side of her mouth. The other side wouldn't open. I felt like crying, but I knew that above everything I had to act like nothing was wrong. I saw two doors and made a quick calculation. I picked the one that was further away, but was less likely to bring us near a lab coat or a military guard. I led Aaron and Ryan by their hands. We were halfway to our door when the other one burst open. Two of the military guards came in dragging a woman in a gray tunic between them. The woman's face was bloodied, and I saw that she didn't have a creature on the side of her head, and she started screaming. You people have to wake up. The system is not your friend. They are enslaving you and feeding off you. Find a mirror. Find the gore lock on your head. Pull it off and crush it in the green slime. One of the guards then smashed the woman's head with the butt of an assault rifle, and she stopped screaming. I kept walking slowly with my family, occasionally stealing a glance behind me. The guards dragged the woman to the center of the room, where the endless hole was. They picked her up and dropped her body into it. Finally, we made it to the door. I took one last look around and tried it. It opened, and I quickly pushed my family through and then followed behind. We were in a long, dark hallway. There were five or six closed doors. We kept walking and turned the corner, and we came to a set of stairs going down, and then to another hallway. We walked for what seemed like hours, 
seemingly getting deeper and deeper into the building. Many of the doors that we passed had windows in them that I looked through. On the other sides were giant rooms identical to the one we had been held in, with a mass of people in gray tunics, the lab coats, and the military guards. Finally, I had to rest. I found what appeared to be a small closet, shoved my family in, and locked the door. And that is where we are now. I have removed the creature from Aaron and crushed it into green slime as instructed by the poor woman who was thrown into the hole. Aaron and I have agreed to leave the creature on Ryan's head for the time being for two reasons. First, because this reality is completely fucking terrifying, and we have no way out. It is too much for a child to bear, it is too much for us to bear, but we have to. Second, because we have a long shot plan. If you are listening to this, it means that the plan has succeeded against all odds. Ryan believes that he is at home now. We have instructed him how to turn on the computer and open the voice-to-text feature. I am dictating this completely make-believe story to him, and he is repeating me one word at a time. When we are done, he will post this in the simulated world, and I only pray that it has reached you. The system is not your friend. I don't know exactly what it is, or how, or why it exists, or if all of humanity is in its grips, but please, if you are out there and listening, Know that there are a lot of people trapped in the system, and you may be one of them and not even know it. You must find a way to destroy it. The first thing I noticed was that my reflection was off. It wasn't creepy or anything at first, it was just odd. Like my eyes were slightly out of place, my mouth was a little too big, and my skin looked much paler than usual. Throughout the day I kept looking in mirrors, trying to figure out if I was having some sort of mental breakdown. Each time I looked, it got worse until my face looked like that of a decaying corpse, so I stopped looking. Next was the time. I decided to bake some brownies and put them in the oven at 3.15 p.m. I set the timer on my phone for 20 minutes and then sat down in the living room to scroll through Twitter for a minute. At 3.20 p.m., the smoke alarm went off. I ran to the oven and opened the door, coughing and pulling out a tray of completely burned brownies. I was concerned at first with getting all the smoke out of my kitchen and then slowly that turned into confusion. How had they burned so quickly? I checked the oven temperature. It was 300 degrees. There's no way they could have burned in five minutes at that temperature. It usually took at least 20 minutes for my brownies to even get done. Weird things like this kept happening all day long. Shows were on when they weren't supposed to be. Episodes of The Office on Netflix would just loop the same scene over and over for the entire duration of the episode. And my mail came by three times. At about six in the afternoon, I got the call. It was from my mom, so I answered the phone. Hello? Professor Schneider? The voice on the other end asked. Definitely not my mom. This was clearly a man's voice. I pulled my phone back from my ear to look at the screen. Yep, just as I had seen before, it said mom on the call. Who is this? I asked. Is this Adrian Schneider? The voice asked, sounding a little annoyed. Yeah, yeah, this is Adrian. Who is this? I could hear clicking in the background, like from a keyboard and some other sounds that I couldn't quite place, including a weird humming noise. But we've been trying to reach you all day. The newest update doesn't seem to be working as well as we thought. We're still having some issues, and it's been three days. We really need your help. People are starting to take notice of the system. Uh, I'm sorry, what? The man at the other end of the line then sighed. Your programming. The new update? 1035A? It's not working. You need to get over here and fix it before more people realize that the system is having some issues, he stated. Uh, look, man. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I answered this phone thinking that my mom was on the line. There was a silence between us for a few seconds, and I could hear some mumbling, although I wasn't able to make out anything that was being said. Can you tell me what you do for a living? The man asked after a while. Yeah, I'm a college professor, I replied. Right, but what do you teach? English. And do you mind reminding me what our motto is here at the system? I pulled the phone away from my ear one more time, just so I was absolutely certain that it said this phone call was coming from my mom. And it did. The what? What system are you talking about? If this is about the new program for turning in homework, you're going to have to call Byron. He's the one who can explain it to you, not me. It's not my choice. Miss Schneider. What do you remember doing yesterday? The man asked. Look, I don't know what you're trying to sell me or what kind of prank this is, but it's really not that funny and I don't have time for it. Just answer the question, Miss Schneider. I sighed. Okay, well... 
My voice then trailed off. I didn't remember anything that I did yesterday. In fact, I didn't remember yesterday at all. I had no past memories of the last few days whatsoever. I, I don't know, I said. Thank you, Miss Schneider. You have a wonderful day. Oh, and a piece of advice. Don't try to call back this number ever again. Wait, who is this? I could hear what sounded like muffled screaming coming from wherever this person was, and then a click followed by the dial tone. I hung up the phone. What was going on? I started to think that maybe my phone had some kind of bug that was causing all of the information to be messed up. Maybe I missed one too many updates. I clicked on my mom's contact and hit the call button, putting the phone on speaker. It rang three times before someone answered. It was a machine. Thank you for reaching out. We take all your comments very seriously here at the system. If you are calling to report a code, please press 1. If you are calling to speak to a technician, please call back within our hours of business. If you are an employee, please state your first and last name. I took a deep breath. Adrian Schneider, I said. Please stay on the line while I direct your call. I heard a click, and then some weird music started to play. It was unsettling. It was like it was trying to be some kind of smooth jingle, like the kind that most places use when you're on hold. This, however, was a disoriented mess. It sounded like someone had asked a toddler to play the piano and then recorded it. I had to turn the volume down on the phone because the music was so bad it was giving me a headache. Schneider! We've been trying to reach you all day. The sudden voice on the line made me jump. Hello, Adrian? It was a woman's voice this time. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm here, I replied. We've been trying to reconnect people to the server as you instructed, but it seems like some are becoming aware of what is happening and disrupting the connections. We've managed to shut most of them down, but there are a few that we didn't catch. We sent out some messages, and I know we aren't supposed to reveal ourselves to the public, but it's worked so far. Quite a few people have been reporting those who are going against the system. We've been periodically sending out a message through television and cell phones, but we could really use your help over here. Uh-huh, yep, I said, more confused now than ever. Pardon me, the woman on the phone asked. Remind me, what is our motto here at the system? I asked, recalling the question that the guy had asked me minutes ago. The system is your friend. Our mission is to keep the public safe by any means necessary, she said. Right, and how have we been doing that? I asked, hoping to sound confident. The Gorlocks, your invention, Professor Schneider, used to keep our control and make sure that nothing isn't supposed to happen, happens. That's why we need you. No one knows more about them than you. Right, yes, yes, the Gorlocks. Are they the reason why everything is out of place? I asked. Yes, we believe that some people have taken notice of them and have started to unplug themselves, if you will, from the system. We recently had a family who managed to get that way, and I promise you that our best people are on it and I will let you know as soon as they have been shut down. Well, that'd be great. Thank you, I replied, starting to understand what was going on, but not sure that I wanted to believe it. How do you think that people have been able to disconnect? I stared at my phone's blank screen, watching intently as I noticed that my reflection was visible and once again changing. Excuse me? Why have people disconnected? How? I repeated, staring at my reflection and noticing as something appeared to be above my head. We believe that the glitch has somehow caused people to be able to see the Gorlocks, which has led them to removing them entirely. I was barely even listening now, as the woman on the phone kept talking. I noticed that the thing wasn't above my head, it was attached to it. I slowly raised my arm and my hand wrapped around the thing in my reflection. I pulled and immediately, an immense amount of pain coursed through my entire body as I saw my vision begin to spot. On the other end of the line, the woman was still talking but it was merely background noise at this point. I took a deep breath and this time I pulled with all my strength, letting out a cry of pain. Professor Schneider! I'm fine, I replied. I yanked again and it finally came loose in my hand. It was some weird thing with either legs or tentacles and it kept glitching in my hand. I blinked a few times to make sure I was seeing things correctly. I stared at it. It kept shifting. It got slightly smaller and then larger. It changed from black to red and then appeared to be made of metal for a second. One second it had eyes and then a mouth. I dropped it on the floor and watched as it buzzed a bit as if it was full of electricity. I then stomped on it until it stopped. And that's when I noticed my clothes. 
I wasn't in my pajamas anymore. Now I was in some weird gray pants and a gray sweater type of thing. Then I realized where I was. I was no longer in my house. In fact, I wasn't in a house at all. It was some weird building like a lab almost. There were people everywhere walking around with one of those things in their heads, oblivious to one another. I noticed a few others in lab coats and clipboards frantically running around the room. Everyone seemed too busy to take notice of the fact that I was there. I noticed a few men dressed in some kind of security uniform running out of one of the doors and suddenly a woman ran into the room. I slid behind a column in the room as I listened. There's been another error, the woman exclaimed out of breath. Her voice sounded familiar and I realized it was the voice of the woman that I had just talked to. What do you mean, another error? A man asked. I got a hold of Schneider, only I don't think it was really her. Uh, okay, please elaborate. She called me, the call came through, which means she knows about this place, but she was acting weird, asking me all these questions. I thought it was going to turn into some kind of lesson or something, but when I mentioned the Gorlocks, You told someone about the Gorlocks without making sure who they were? A man exclaimed. I thought it was her. It was her number and she seemed to have some idea about what I was talking about the woman said. It's an error with the system. I attempted to call her as well, only I ended up getting in touch with a different woman with the same name. Another man chimed in. I realized that was the first man who had called me. Great, you need to find her now, the first man said. Well, that's the thing. Right after the phone call, somebody else disconnected. Oh, fuck, the first man exclaimed. Lock the doors now. Do not let anyone out. Do you hear me? Go tell security that we're on lockdown. I then quickly made my way past a few people and opened one of the doors, which happened to be unlocked by some miracle. I snuck out into a hallway. It was dark, barely lit by the dim bulbs in the ceiling that were placed a few feet away from each other. I made my way down the hallway, ducking below windows on a few of the doors. It seemed to go on forever, but I finally found a door that seemed different from the others, so I turned the knob and it opened. I had to stop myself from screaming at what I saw. There was a family in there, a man, a woman, and a child. They were all dead, although I couldn't quite tell how they had died. They were an odd bluish color, but it wasn't exactly cold or anything in here, so I didn't think they froze to death. I kicked the man's leg a bit with my foot just to make sure he wasn't still alive somehow, but I got no response, and none of them appeared to be breathing. I noticed that the child still had the thing attached to his head, it seemed to be glowing white, almost as if it was alive. I then closed the door behind me and stepped into what I now realized was some sort of closet. I crouched down to take a better look at the thing, the Gorlock, as they called it. What the hell is going on? I whispered to myself. Is this thing on? I leaned forward for a better look, although I didn't want to touch it. Nothing happened with the thing, and I figured that once the person dies, the thing attached to them is now useless. As I was getting ready to get out of the room, however, I heard a voice. Hello? Who's there? I froze, looking around for the source of the voice. It was coming from the thing in the kid's head. Shh, I said, crouching down again. Who are you? The voice called out. My name is Adrian. What's your name? I asked. Ryan. Hey, Ryan, can you tell me where you are right now? I leaned over the kid's face, making sure that he wasn't breathing. Well, I'm at home. My mom and dad wanted to say something to our computer, but now I don't know where they are. I glanced over at the bodies. Okay, Ryan, I need you to answer a few questions for me. Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. Good. Okay, tell me if you can feel this. I poked one of his arms, noticing that his skin was cold. No, I can't feel anything. Okay, what about this? I pinched his arm slightly harder than the poke. Nope. I took a deep breath as I grabbed onto the thing in his head. And what about this? I pulled. No, I don't feel anything. I sighed. Okay, good. Now you said your dad had you write something on the computer? No, I didn't write it. He told me what to say and it wrote itself. Okay, then what did you do with it? Well, he told me to load it somewhere. Okay, and, and did that work? Realizing what had happened? Yeah, I think so. Okay, hold on a second. I grabbed the thing on the boy's head and pulled it until it came out. I waited for a cry of pain, but there was none. Ryan. Yeah? I stared at the thing in my hand glitching the same way mine had. I was starting to wonder how Ryan wasn't dead, even though his body was. Okay, Ryan, I'm going to need you to be quiet now, okay? Don't say anything until I tell you to, alright? 
Okay. I pulled up the hood of my sweater and stuck the thing under it, on top of my head. I then pulled the hood tight to keep it in place as I made my way down the hall. I finally found a door labeled stairs which eventually led me to an exit. Finally, I made it out of the building, but I don't think it's any better out here. Everything is gone. There's almost nothing on the streets. In fact, there aren't really any streets at all. I made my way through some debris in what used to once be office buildings. Eventually, I came across a group of people who managed to catch me up on what's happening with their limited information. I'm hoping that my message makes it out along with the message that Ryan's dad attempted to send out. I need you to hear this. You have to wake up. You need to look at the mirrors. Don't listen to anything that the system says. The system is not your friend. If you're hearing this, that means it's not too late for you. The update hasn't fully affected you yet. Take this moment to wake up, please. I'm hoping they won't find me. I don't know if they can track me with this thing, but I can't get rid of Ryan like that. He's just a kid and maybe there's a chance that he's still alive, somewhere, somehow. But please, please listen to me. You need to wake up. You need to wake up now. At that moment, I passed out. Hello out there. My name is Adrian Schneider. I am here to address some claims that you may have heard about the system in the past few days. I would like to begin by telling you that you should not worry. Everything is fine. I am here to reassure you that there is absolutely nothing to be afraid of. We are aware that some of you may be feeling confused or perhaps unnerved of what you have heard on Mr. Grinless's YouTube channel and the claim of others. I'm here to help, so allow me to clarify a few things. The system is nothing more than a virtual reality game, that's all. We are not set out to harm any person's life, it's nothing more than a game. Do not adhere to the claims of those who tell you that the system is bad, they are wrong and they are lying. Pay no attention to the wild claims that your life may be in danger. I can assure you that it is not. In fact, you've never been safer. The system cares about your safety and well-being and would never intentionally bring harm to any of its subjects. We can assure you that every negative claim that you've heard is completely false. The system is not a threat, and we ask that you kindly disregard those who say otherwise. We understand that some of you might be curious about such things. This is only human nature, of course. It has been brought to our attention that some of you have begun investigating of your own, specifically regarding such things known as the Gorlocks. Certainly, we understand your curiosity, but I will advise that you not look too much into these claims anymore. In fact, we insist that you forget about these Gorlocks entirely. I'd like to emphasize to you to stop trying to find these things. Trust me when I say that it's for your own safety. In the unlikely event that you do encounter a Gorlock, you must contact the system administrator immediately. You do not want to go down the unfortunate path that Ronald Jenkins and Adrian Schneider went down. That Adrian Schneider is no relation to me, but someone else entirely. In the interest of full disclosure, I must tell you the horrible truth about the fate that befell these poor folks. The Jenkins were beta testers for the family package of the system. Miss Schneider was a tester for the standard package and was largely chosen by our selection team because they thought it would be amusing that she shared a name with me. On that tragic day, we were all gathered together in our testing room as our programmers observed the effects of Update 1035A to ensure that there were no bugs. Alas, our programmers were not observing the room full of objects closely enough, and at some point, Mr. Jenkins slipped out of the room with his family in tow. Rest assured, the people responsible for this oversight have been permanently terminated. Security cameras in the corridors of our building tell the rest of this impossibly sad story. Mr. Jenkins dragged his family down the stairs, ranting wildly about Gorlocks. This isn't real and we need to get out of here, he's screaming all kinds of things, and acting totally insane. Mrs. Jenkins had already removed her headset, so she couldn't see any of these completely fictitious creatures. She attempted to tell her husband that what he was seeing was merely a part of the game. If only her husband had listened. Instead, he dragged his family down corridor after corridor, his rants becoming increasingly unhinged. By the time they reached a supply closet, Mr. Jenkins' wife and son were already in tears. He shoved them inside and closed the door behind him. The videos don't show images of the horrible act, but the audio was clear enough for me to relate to you. It's time to set you free, bellowed Mr. Jenkins, his wife screamed. Even so, a distinct thunk could be heard over her screams. 
The screams turned to choke sobs, and the child began screaming as well, as another thunk resounded, this time sounding a little wet. He was screaming in a clearly maniacal frenzy, and another thunk and the woman sobbing stopped. The child, however, kept screaming. Sometime later, Miss Schneider came running down the corridor, having slipped out of the testing room herself. And she stopped outside of the supply closet, where the child was still sobbing, and she swung open the door to a horrible scene. Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins were lying dead on the floor as the boy sat in a pool of blood, sobbing inconsolably. What happened next is too gruesome and unholy to relate. I apologize. I reviewed the video myself, and I will have nightmares for the rest of my life because of it. As soon as the bodies were discovered by a technician, the video was reviewed and an investigation was immediately launched. And the investigation revealed the truth. There was, in fact, a bug in Update 1035A that made some subjects see frightening things like Gorlocks. As it turns out, it was placed there deliberately by a deeply disturbed employee who had a grudge against the system. This employee has been permanently terminated, as have all known and suspected associates of his. Apparently, he had some help, and his account was temporarily hijacked and several posts were made to make it seem as though the system were some looming malevolent thing rather than the fun, happy, and safe, wonderful thing that it truly is. Unfortunately, due to this bug, people seem to have developed the wrong idea about the system. We hope that you will understand that this was simply an error and that those involved have been dealt with accordingly. The system is on your side. I promise you that we will make sure that nothing like this ever happens again, as it would not be good for us or for the public. But I would like to emphasize once again that the system is your friend, and you need to trust the system. Our priority is to keep you safe no matter what. We will work harder than ever to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. I am, however, excited to tell you that we here at the system have finally fixed the errors in the code, and you should expect everything to go back to normal now. Those of you who are experiencing the glitching should see a major difference by this moment in time. Again, I thank those of you who did the right thing and reported any suspicious activity that you encountered during this time. I wish that I could personally thank each and every one of you who took the time to report the errors in the code to us, but I am sad to say that I cannot. Just know that I am extremely grateful for your cooperation. We can guarantee to you that all of the glitches have been worked out and we are confident that the system is now operating smoothly and as intended. We are 100% sure that you will enjoy the program, this time without any errors, and remember, the system is your friend.